death. It is the essential inevitability at the heart of the human experience. For thousands of generations, we have tried to find ways to explain and cope with the looming specter of mortality, whether through religion, folk tales, philosophy, or science. Mankind endeavors to understand death and the possibilities of what may lie beyond. Strangely enough, despite differences in location, society, and tradition, almost all civilizations share a similar concept of death, one which describes the passage of souls into another world. Whether it is called Urkala, Sheol, Naraka, Yomi, Adlivu, Miklan, Shibalba, Buku Pasha, Tuonela, Niflheim, Tartarus, Hell, or any other name, the underworld lies beyond the gap between death and the afterlife. Death's process involves the soul's journey, whether it be across a bridge, a body of water, or through gates of trial, judgment awaits on the other side to determine the nature of each individual's eternity, whether it be punishment, happiness, or something else. The idea of the underworld leads to stories of gods and goddesses who preside over the eternal realms below, but there is also another entity who appears after death. When souls go on their journey, they are accompanied by a guide who is collectively called the Psychopomp. Psychopompos, the original Greek root of the word, literally means guide of souls. And it is from Greek mythology that many of you have likely encountered tales of one such guide, Charon the Ferryman. Charon ferries the souls of the dead in his boat across the river Styx and Acheron, the boundaries of the Greek underworld. It is common practice to bury the dead with coins or other valuables as payment for the psychopomp. Funerary custom, born from grief and respect for the departed, is practiced as an effort by the living to assist the dead in their passage to the afterlife. Burial mounds, graveyards, tombs, catacombs, and other structures that house the remains of the dead are as omnipresent as death itself in the mortal world we inhabit. And thus, these places have found their way into popular culture as perfect settings for morbid and terrifying stories. After all, across the history of humanity, our greatest fear is the unknown. And what greater unknown is there than what lies beyond the embrace of death? I'm Brian Edwards, and I welcome you to join me for a special episode as we explore the personification of death. This is Dark Souls, a new mythology. Nita First of the Dead Grave Warden Agday in Dark Souls 2 characterizes Nito as the one who gave us the first death, and the item description for Nito's Lord Soul states that he administers the death of all manner of beings. This makes it sound as if Nito plays a passive role, merely 
the god of death. However, in Dark Souls, if servants deepen their allegiance to Nido greatly enough, they gain the Gravelord Sword Dance ability. Its description offers further insight into Nito's role. Nito sleeps deep within the giant catacombs, quietly overseeing all death and waiting for his servants to usher in the Eye of Death. While this reinforces Nito himself as a passive force in machinations of the Dark Souls universe, it also reveals that his servants carry out the will of their master by proliferating death. They use the Eye of Death item to corrupt the worlds of others and significantly increase their chances of dying. Nito administers all death, but it is up to his servants and the universe of Dark Souls itself to do the dirty work. Death is delegated to those with the power to weave fate. As you may already expect, the archetypes associated with Nido are rooted deeply in mythology, stretching beyond the lore of Dark Souls. In Greek myth, the personification of death is known as Thanatos. Thanatos not only oversees all death, but also acts as a guide for souls to the underworld. It is common in mythology for many different deities to have overlapping responsibilities and attributes, depending on what stories you read and from which historical era or geographical location those stories originate. For instance, Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, rules over death, judgment, punishment, and also the good parts of the afterlife. He is sometimes directly involved in these tasks, but is more often only the overseer. Thanatos presides specifically over death, but like his superior, Hades, his duties are mostly delegated to his siblings. Jerus, god of old age, Oises, goddess of suffering, Moros, god of doom, Apate, goddess of deception, Momus, god of disgrace, Eris, goddess of strength, Nemesis, goddess of retribution, and Charon, the ferryman. Although Thanatos and Charon share the responsibility of the psychopomp in Greek mythology, when we think of souls traveling to the underworld in popular culture, it is most often Charon who we see, guiding the dead in his boat. As stories which originated in Greece eventually spread throughout Europe, Thanks to the far-reaching borders of the Roman Empire, Charon's ore eventually shifted into a different tool, and the plague-stricken peoples of Northern Europe weaved their own folklore about the deathly visitor who carried their loved ones away into the afterlife. Today, the Western world knows death's personification as the Grim Reaper, a skeletal specter shrouded in black who carries a scythe. The Reaper's image is ubiquitous in popular culture, whether appearing in books, movies, music, video games, or any other form of media. He is always the same fulfilling the same role as a portent of death 
and psychopomp for the deceased. The Reaper's origins are a blend of numerous stories in European folklore, influenced by the prevalence of disease and superstition among disparate cultures after the fall of the Roman Empire and further molded throughout the Dark Ages and Middle Ages with the spread of Christianity. Celtic folktales describe the Anku, a tall, haggard, or skeletal man who drives a ghostly cart piled with corpses. The Irish have the Dullahan, a headless man on horseback who carries his disembodied head under an arm as it smiles wickedly, calling out the names of those whose time has come. The Irish also tell stories of the Banshee, a female spirit whose wailing shrieks herald the approaching demise of those who hear them. In the Netherlands, death is called Meager Heinrich, and many other somewhat comical names. My personal favorite? The Bone Man. He appears as a skeleton, wielding a scythe. Even in Scandinavia, tales of a skeletal reaper seep into their culture, as Christianity overshadows the old Norse myths. During the Black Plague, there are stories of Pesta, an old, ugly hag in a black hood who carries a rake or broom, spreading disease from town to town. Christianity usually introduces the imagery of the Grim Reaper by way of the Dance Macabre, or Dance of Death. It is an image symbolizing not only the shared characteristic of mortality, but also the equality of humans in the face of death, whether they be popes, kings, laborers, or children. All are shown dancing together with the skeletal figure of death into the afterlife. The Reaper also features prominently in later Christian art when depicting the fourth horseman of the Apocalypse, who is foretold in the Book of Revelation to be Death himself. In Latin America, there are long-established folktales of deathly gods and saints who existed prior to Christianity's introduction but are now merged with the Grim Reaper's imagery, helping further shape the iconography of death as we know its personification today. Aztec mythology features the Lady of the Dead, a skeletal goddess who watches over the bones of the dead and who also presides over festivals for the dead. These customary festivals eventually spread throughout Latin America, becoming the modern holiday known as the Day of the Dead. The Day of the Dead is celebrated primarily in Mexico with the veneration of Santa Muerta, also known as Our Lady of the Holy Death. Santa Muerta appears as a robed, skeletal woman who carries a scythe and helps the dead on their journey into the afterlife. Other South American cultures have similar personifications of death, such as Exu, who watches over cemeteries, Santa La Muerta, who is very similar to Santa Muerta, but unrelated, and San Pasqualito, the king of the graveyard. Most of these saintly lords are skeletal figures wielding scythes who preside over death and disease. The Latin American gods of death 
tasked with keeping watch over burial sites, governing death and disease, and assisting the dead, resonate strongly with the archetypes we see as we examine Gravelord Nito in Dark Souls. Nito is an amalgamation of Grim Reaper imagery. He appears hunched over, hooded, and cloaked in black. His body is formed by the combined skeletons of numerous corpses, like a walking burial mound, and he wields a long, curved sword, similar to the blade of a scythe. In the opening cinematic of Dark Souls, he is shown battling the everlasting dragons using a miasma of death and disease. The way objects around Nito are seen shriveling and decaying suggests his miasma is not just some terrible odor, which is the usual English definition of the word, but instead represents Miasma's other, less used definition. An oppressive or unpleasant atmosphere which surrounds or emanates from something. Gravelord Nito's Miasma is an aura of death, killing everything that comes near him. It is also described as spreading disease which is an idea similar to stories from plague-stricken areas of Europe, like the old hag, Pesta. This ability is part of why Nito resides separately from the other lords in Lordron, because the others fear his innate and indiscriminate power to kill. It is a characterization common to gods of death in Western mythology, such as the Norse gods who fear Hela and the Greek gods who fear Thanatos. The Theogony, written by the Greek poet Hesiod, describes Thanatos' relationship with the other gods as follows. He has a heart of iron, and his spirit within him is pitiless as bronze. Whomsoever of men he has once seized, he holds fast, and he is hateful even to the deathless gods. Nito, like Thanatos, has the ability to bring death to anything and anyone, even his fellow lords of the first flame. And so, he lives in the tombs, deep below Lordron, in the underworld. In documented Dark Souls lore, surrounding the painted world of Ariamis, Crossbreed Priscilla, Delka, and Havel the Rock, there occurs a rebellion against the lords at some point during the Age of Fire. The first objective of this rebellion is, of course, to seize Nito's power and use it against the Lords. Velka's rebellion fails, though, as Gwyn's forces are victorious before the rebels are able to reach their goal. Nito retreats after this event to protect his occult power from being stolen and to distance himself even further from the other lords. Interestingly, the goal of Velka's rebellion is very much like Hela's role during Ragnarok, the apocalyptic end of the world foretold by Norse mythology. At the time of Ragnarok, Loki will betray the other gods and use his daughter Hela's necromancy 
to raise an army of the dishonorable dead. In the original Dark Souls, when the player encounters Nito, it is after their journey takes them through a graveyard, into the catacombs beneath, and even further down, to a place where even Gwen's sunlight cannot reach. There, hidden deep in the underworld, the Gravelord rests in a giant coffin. When facing Nito in battle, he uses his Gravelord sword dance ability to strike at the player from a distance with ghostly blades that rise from the ground beneath. These phantom attacks match the appearance of his own scythe-like sword. Just before he uses this ability, however, the player can hear shrieking screams which gives them time to dodge each attack. This is reminiscent of the Banshee's Wail, foretelling the approach of death. The name of the ability itself also seems to be a direct reference to the Dance of Death. Another attack to watch out for when fighting Nito in close quarters is the swing of his sword. If the player gets hit too many times, they are inflicted with toxic disease. This, once again, harkens back to the plague hag, Pesta. The last major ability Nito uses to kill players is an area of effect attack. Nito will stop moving for a few seconds as the player can see a black aura gathering around his hunched, skeletal form. Then, the aura explodes outward, dealing massive damage and causing toxic status. Just as it's shown in the game's opening cinematic, Nito's area of effect attack spreads a miasma of death and disease, eliminating any who dare to approach. Nito and his loyal servants are responsible for watching over and guarding burial sites so that the dead can rest in peace, undisturbed. However, this venerable task shifts in purpose when the first flame fades and Gwyn unleashes the undead curse upon humanity. The dead no longer rest after this cataclysmic event, but instead rise from their graves to live again, bent to the will of the first flame. From this point forward, Nito and his servants not only protect the resting places of the dead, but also fight to keep the undead from escaping their rightful tomb. The Gravelord's servants become wardens, ensuring that the undead will be killed over and over again so that they may rest at least for a little while. But as Nito retreats deeper and deeper to escape the threat of Velka and protect his fellow lords, time marches ever onward. The ranks of his servants dwindle, and eventually the tombs of Lordron are overrun with pillagers and necromancers who enslave the dead to serve in their twisted occult experiments. That is, until a player comes along in Dark Souls and finally manages to kill Nito. I realize this presents a problematic scenario depending on how you interpret Nito being the first of the dead. 
if Nito is literally the first dead being in the world of Dark Souls, then it is difficult to explain how the player could kill something which is already dead. Given that paradox, I find the literal interpretation to be invalid. We can only safely recognize Nito as an administer or overseer of death. He is not dead himself until the player kills him. This is supported by numerous quotes from in-game lore, many of which I mentioned earlier in the episode, in addition to comparisons drawn to other gods of death in Western mythology. After killing Nito and taking his Lord Soul, the player fulfills their ultimate quest to link the first flame. The world is reborn and the cycle repeats again and again as countless kingdoms rise and fall to the fading flame and its undead curse. Nito's responsibility to watch over and protect the resting places of the dead passes down through these numerous cycles as his Lord Soul exerts its influence in each era. By the time of Dark Souls 2, Grave Wardens in the Kingdom of Drangling are called the Finito. They no longer know Nito by name, or at least his name is never mentioned in the game. However, as Grave Warden Agdane's words prove, they are absolutely aware of his past existence and continue to exercise his will in their own way. Apart from the Finito, there also exist four sisters called the Milfinito, who have inherited the gift of song through the influence of Nito's Lord Soul. When the Milfinito sing, their voices comfort the undead, and so they remain in the dark places below the world, singing to guide the undead into peaceful rest. There is another aspect to their strange power as well. When they sing, fireflies gather around any nearby undead. Fireflies are a symbol usually associated with impermanence, nostalgia, and death in Western cultures. The life of an adult firefly is short, ending soon after mating and laying eggs. And firefly larvae sometimes remain in hibernation for years before reaching adulthood, like cursed undead, waiting to live again and repeat the cycle. It's worth noting, though, that Dark Souls is a franchise created by a Japanese production team, and in Japan, fireflies have other associations. Rather than viewing their short lifespans from a negative perspective, fireflies are instead a symbol of passionate love and are positively associated with farewell ceremonies, such as school graduations and the end of the year. This way, the song of the Milfinito may be interpreted as an expression of love for the undead, easing them peacefully through existence at the end of their cursed lives. Like relatives gathering around the family shrine to make offerings of song during Day of the Dead celebrations in Latin America. The opening cinematic of Dark Souls 2 shows the fireflies of the Milfinito greeting the player character as they reach the edge of Drang Lake's borders. Fireflies swarm about and beckon the chosen undead to leap into an enormous whirlpool where they are swallowed 
and later transported to the starting area of the game. This strange whirlpool phenomenon exudes a foreboding and oppressive atmosphere, which could be described more succinctly as miasmal. And thus, it's difficult to determine whether the Milfinito are a positive or negative actor with regards to the undead who find themselves in Drang Lake. Arguably, their role could be like that of the sirens in Greek mythology, luring the undead closer to Drang Lake with their enchanting voices, only to lead them to their doom. This darker interpretation is supported by the Firefly scene in the opening cinematic, given the fact that Drang Lake, like Lord Round, and countless kingdoms before it, is the final resting place for undead who fail to link the fire. It is revealed later, after the player enters New Game Plus, that the Lord Soul, which once belonged to Nito, and which gifted the Milfinito with song, now resides within a monstrous creature called the Rotten. The Rotten is an amalgamation of corpses joined together in singular purpose. It dwells in the deepest places beneath Drang Lake, collecting things that have been lost. This is all that's left of Nito within the Lord Soul, after eons of returning to and being reborn from the first flame. Only a strong desire to keep the lost ones together and watch over them. Innumerable cycles of the curse follow the events of Dark Souls 2, and the influence of the Lord Souls grows weaker. It becomes difficult to identify their continued independence without reaching into speculation. However, I believe Nito's Lord Soul retains its need to gather things together, as well as its affinity for the underworld, even until the apocalyptic finale of Dark Souls 3. My personal theory is that Nito's desire to gather eventually evolves into an insatiable appetite. The hunger of the God Devourer, Lord Aldrich, Saint of the Deep. Death surrounds all of us. It's an unavoidable part of being alive. We shall all, one day, cease to live. When that time comes, will there be a benevolent guide to show us the way on our next journey? Or will we be greeted by the cold embrace of a skeletal specter who has only come to collect his prize? There is no way to know for sure what awaits us and that's a terrifying thought for many people. Whenever I dwell on it, it's comforting to remember a certain quote from Captain Jean-Luc Picard, a character of the Star Trek franchise. And so, I'd like to leave you all with his words of wisdom. Someone once told me that time was a predator that stalked us all our lives. I rather believe that time is a companion who goes with us on the journey and reminds us to cherish every moment because it will never come again. What we leave behind is not as important as how we've lived. After all, we're only mortal.
Thank you for watching this episode of Dark Souls A New Mythology. This series is written and produced by me, Brian Edwards. Some of you may be familiar with my band, Soul Mass, where we've adapted the lore of Dark Souls to the sounds of punishing death metal and somber doom metal. The Soul Mass YouTube channel hosts this video series, so if you're interested in hearing more, you can check out some of our uploaded music here on the same channel. Music for Dark Souls A New Mythology was composed by Patches the Soundbringer. If you'd like to listen to or purchase his music for this series, you can find a link to his Bandcamp page in the video description. Original artwork for the series was created by Samuel Nelson. You can find a link to his art page in the video description as well, where he sells original work and takes commissions if you're interested in art for an album cover, book cover, or other illustrations. Additional original artwork for the series was created by Unexpected Spectre and Jorge L. Perez. You can also find a link to their art pages in the video description. Narration was recorded at Sciatic Audio by Aaron Sluss and engineered by Brett Winnagel at Hypometric Studio. The Dark Souls game footage used in this video was recorded by Devon Guy. He streams video games on Twitch including lore-centric Soulsborne playthroughs. So check out his channel, linked in the video description, if you are interested in watching him play through the games and hearing his take on Souls lore. Demon Souls, the Dark Souls series, and Bloodborne are properties of From Software, Namco Bandai, and Sony Interactive Entertainment. All of the videos, songs, images, and graphics used in this video belong to their respective owners, and I or this channel do not claim any right over them. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Until we meet again, my fellow undead, don't you dare go hollow.